My number 10 best chess game of the 1980s is Alexander Belyovsky versus John Nunn. These two titans were both champions of their countries, Alexander Belyovsky of the Soviet Union, and John Nunn was a British champion. They both played some of my favorite dynamic attacking games of the 80s. In this game, we're going to see Belyovsky innovate in the opening, placing all of his pawns on light squares, and John Nunn is going to seize his opportunity for a dark square attack. The King's Indian Defense was one of the most popular openings in the 1980s, and it is John Nunn's selected weapon in this game. Belyovsky's choice variation is pawn to f3, the sameish variation, a solid if somewhat conservative option for white. Now, Nunn is going to battle for the dark squares and push forward with pawn to c5 in this position. He's certainly hoping that this bishop can become an absolute monster as it often does in the King's Indian defense. Now Belyovsky will meet this push with the space gaining move pawn to d5 and Nunn will sink his knight into e5, a very strong central posting. Now Belyovsky wants to get rid of this knight on e5 and he would like to do it with pawn to f4, but if he does this right now, the knight can hop to g4 and trade itself for the bishop on e3, gaining important control over the dark squares and an unopposed dark squared bishop for black. Therefore, Belyovsky decides on the move pawn to h3, gaining control over g4 and intending to play pawn to f4 on the next turn. However, this move offends all of my positional instincts. I never like to see all of the pawns be placed on one color complex. Normally, you only see this in scholastic games as young players like to build a wall that their opponent cannot possibly breach. However, as experienced chess players, we know that when you place all of your pawns on one color complex, the other color complex becomes incredibly weak. And Nunn immediately senses the opportunity and strikes out with knight to h5. This knight sortie intends to put the knight into g3. White can absolutely not tolerate that, so the bishop falls back to f2. Sensing opportunity here, Nunn decides to expand further with pawn to f5. In this position, white is uncastled, white is weak on the dark squares, and white has spent a lot of time pushing pawns and not developing the pieces. Even great players like Belyovsky can lose sight of the forest for the trees sometimes and neglect the basic principles. Now, after pawn to f5, Belyovsky had prepared in this position a capture on f5. However, he seems not to have anticipated Nunn's next move. This is a perfect moment to pause your video and try to figure out what Nunn should play. The traditional move in this position is to capture with the pawn. However, Belyovsky had anticipated that move and thought it was forced, and he would have expanded, pushing the knight back and then playing pawn to g3. He has good control in this position, and probably white has a slight advantage. However, none sits all of the opportunities we referenced earlier and selected rook takes f5. Now, Belyovsky and possibly some of you rejected this move because it runs into the move pawn g4, a fork that hits the rook and the knight and wins a piece. However, with all of the advantages we've been discussing, it is very possible for black to sacrifice a piece for the attack in this position, and that is what Nunn has decided to do. In this position, he plays rook takes f3, a beautiful move. Now, it looks like the rook and the knight are hanging, but really you can only take one of them. It is the knight because if you take the rook, then there is a royal fork here and your queen falls on d2. Therefore, we see captures on h5 in this position, and now an excellent move from Nunn, queen to f8. This is a multi-purpose move that obviously creates pressure on the f-file, and it prepares to swing the bishop to h6, when she will gain a very useful diagonal and a tempo on the queen on d2. So after queen to f8, this is a good moment to try and start looking for better defenses for white, who was not able to hold on in the game, and honestly, white may not be able to hold on even with best play. If you try bishop g2 here trying to push the rook away, the rook is ready to sacrifice on f2, dragging the queen into another royal fork. 
Also, in this position, if you try rook to h2, which seems sensible to try to improve the rook, gain control over the second rank, and add defense to f2, then the bishops become monsters. Bishop h6 hitting the queen. The queen can move over, trying to stay on the second rank. Bishop f5. The queen falls back to d1. And the engine recommends many winning moves here, one of the nice ones being rook to d3. This sacrifices a further exchange, but after bishop takes d3, bishop takes d3, black's position is overwhelming. It's very difficult to find anything to move for white. For example, if you move this bishop, there is mate here on f1. If you try to move this knight, there's mate here on f3. The queen and rook and the other rook on a1 don't really have anything productive to do here. And black is intending all kinds of devious moves like queen to f5 and bishop takes c4, followed by knight to d3 check. It's a beautiful attack for black who doesn't seem to have any immediate threats and is down a rook, but really there's no way to hold on for white. In the game, Belyovsky played the move knight to e4, which was, by consensus of the many grandmasters who reviewed this game, the most difficult move for black to defeat. After knight to e4, we see bishop h6 gaining the tempo on that queen. The queen slides over to c2. If the queen were to go to e2, knight d3 check would leave the king with only squares to run to that would drop f2. So you'd have to sacrifice your queen. And some have suggested that this is a good defense and it might be correct to try this for white. White is doing okay on material in this position, but after the queen lunges in with queen f4, white's pieces are so disorganized and black's bishop bishops are monsters the queen is a monster on f4 it really seems like black is very close to winning if not winning already in this position the computer is not optimistic about white's chances so after bishop h6 it was queen c2 that was played and now black played queen to f4 this is actually the one mistake the one and only mistake that John Nunn makes in this game. Instead, stronger was bishop to f5, putting immediate pressure here on the knight on e4. If in this position the knight captures on f3, picking off that rook, the knight takes f3 check, and after the king moves over, you have knight to d2. This puts pressure on the pin knight on e4, and it wins material. If white tries to hold on by pulling the bishop up to d3, you can simply trade here and then take on f2, and black should be winning in this position. Black is no longer really significantly down on material, and black's pieces are still monsters. Backing up, after queen f4, nun's one mistake, we pause the video and ask the question, can white take the rook on f3, or does white have a better defensive move? Yes, as it turns out, Belyovsky can and should accept the rook here on f3. After knight takes f3, knight takes f3 with check, king d1, bishop f5, it seems like black's attack is tremendously strong with all of this pressure here on the pin knight on e4. But in this position, the excellent defensive move, bishop to g3, reveals that black's queen is running short of squares. White is willing to give back material to get the queens off the board, a classic defensive technique. There's no way for none to avoid this. If queen e3, then queen d3. And if you pick up this knight here on e4, the queen trade resolves the pressure for white. And now bishop g2 reveals that what matters is white is up in exchange and white has very good chances to win this endgame. This was a huge opportunity missed for Belyovsky. He's not going to get another chance in this game. Instead, after queen f4, he played the move knight to e2, which allows none to play the excellent move, rook takes f2, boom. This very, very strong move is simply overwhelming. There's no defense anymore. Now, it looks like we're sacrificing the queen and the rook, but after knight takes f4, it's actually a queen trade that leaves black ahead of material with a continuing attack. The position is simply over. So after rook takes f2, you must accept the rook and now knight f3 check and then king over to d1 and the excellent move, queen to h4, a very sneaky move. The queen slides to the edge of the board to line up on this diagonal here, hitting the undefended knight on uh, f2. And if the knight moves to the wrong square, the queen invades to e1 and it is checkmate. 
Therefore, forced for white is knight to d3, moving the knight to the one square where it can defend this mate on e1. After knight d3, natural for none is bishop to f5, developing that bishop and pinning the knight here on d3. In this position, Belyovsky plays the very sad move knight e to c1 to defend that knight on d3. Sometimes as a defender, you have to play ugly moves to try to hold on because there's just nothing better. But when you have to play a sad move like knight e to c1, you're already feeling like this game is probably going to be beyond saving. And in this position, you're not wrong. You're going to have to hope that none makes a misstep. However, he does not. He plays the strongest move, the excellent and beautiful knight to d2, probably my favorite move in the game. Knight to d2 threatens two things. One is simply knight takes c4, followed by knight to e3 check, which is a huge threat. The other point here is that if you defend c4 with, for example, b3, the queen here on c2 is cut off from the defense of the queen side by this beautifully posted knight here on d2, which is all up in the inner workings of white's position. Now you can attack the, the loose pieces on the king side. So queen to e4 attacking this rook is winning. If the rook moves off of this first rank, then the bishop on f1 is undefended. And if it tries to stay on the first rank, then rook g1, queen to e3, rook h1, queen f3 check finally forks and picks up this rook here on h1 with a winning game. So after knight d2, we see a trade here on g6, and then we see bishop g2, accepting that there's no way to hold on to the pawn here on c4. Knight takes c4, and now because of this huge fork here on uh, e3, the queen moves out of the way of the royal fork, queen f2, knight e3 check, king to e2, and queen c4. The c4 square is the pivotal point in this point in this phase of the black attack. There's obviously the idea here of queen into uh, c2. If white does nothing, for example, rook h2 just to pick a move, then queen check, king down here, and queen d1 mate a similar mate to the mate that we saw on e1 just a little bit earlier. Therefore, we see in this position after queen c4, the defensive move bishop to f3 so that the bishop can help defend this d1 square and hold off this mate. None simply decides to include the rook on a8 in the attack with rook f8. Rook g1 in this position, knight c2 hitting the uh, rook on a1. And in this position, Belyovsky doesn't even defend the rook on a1. He plays king to d1, and none does not even take the rook on a1. Instead, he takes the knight on d3. None's decision to not even take the rook on a1, but instead to pick off the knight on d3, was enough to make Belyovsky resign the game in this position. This was a beautiful attack from John Nunn. Yasser Sarawan even ranked this game as his favorite game of the 1980s. If you want to see more of my favorite games of the 1980s or the 1990s, then simply click on the playlists that are sitting right on top of your screen.